Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. Joining me today is Jacob Imchangama, a Danish lawyer, human rights advocate, and social commentator. He is the founder and director of Justitia, a Copenhagen-based think tank focusing on human rights, freedom of speech, and the rule of law. His new book is Free Speech, a history from Socrates to social media. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Jacob. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to it. How new is the concept of free speech? <laughs> That's a good question. I, I find its origins uh, stretching all the way back to the Athenian democracy of ancient times, so uh, around 2,500 years. So the Athenians is where, you know, of course, you know, th there might well have been other civilizations or cultures prior to the Athenians, but th that's the historical, by the historical records that we've got, I, I find that the Athenian democracy is the earliest polity where free speech is both sort of a, a political and a civic principle. So you basically have two conceptions of free speech, one of them being isegoria or equality of speech, which means that all freeborn male citizens have a direct voice in in debating and voting on laws in, in the assembly in, in, in Athens. And then you have the concept of parousia, which is broader civic uh, cultural trait of Athenian democracy, uh, sort of uninhibited speech, it means, which, which allowed the, the Athenians to be bold and daring in their in, in, in social dissent, uh, and, and, and which, again, was premised on sort of a, a commitment to tolerance of, of social dissent, of course, with certain limits, as Socrates would, would find out at some point. You said men. This did not apply to women, I assume? Uh, certainly not. Uh, certainly not. Uh, um, po political speech is a career that was only freeborn male male citizens, and, and and so so that would only be Athenian freeborn men, or not slaves or, or foreigners. You could you would you know, parousia would would also apply to foreigners, but 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 women were sort of mostly hidden away <laughs> in Athenian uh, society, so certainly not treated uh, as, uh, as 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 equals. Uh, you do see, you know, there are some sort of hints at, at sort of proto-feminism, but 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 certainly, I think it would be fair to say that it was exercised by men, and we have to get pretty far into the history of free speech before 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 women have anything uh, close to 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 equality of speech with with men, unfortunately. So, what did happen, Socrates? If if there was some at least some amount of fairly robust principled belief in free speech, we know what happened to him, and evidently it didn't go all the way. I think the important thing is to remember that 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 he was sort of uh, 70 or so before he was tried and, uh, and executed. Um, and so for decades, he had actually uh, been the most prolific practitioner of parousia uh, in, 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 in Athens. He had Accosted to the good citizens of Athens in the agora, sort of the marketplace, where he would sort of uh, roast uh, people who, who who didn't manage to escape him uh, in in these humiliating Q and A's uh, in, in his Socratic uh, method. Uh, so 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 it's not as, as if there had never been tolerance for for Socrates' um, use of parousia. I think we have to look uh, at some specific backgrounds, namely uh, namely that um, the Athenian democracy had been overthrown twice by oligarchs and that Socrates had had close contacts with some of the leading figures uh, of, uh, in, in involved in, in these coups. Uh, and so the Athenians had become much more jealous about the democracy. Um, and, and it's also, you know, Socrates was not an enthusiastic believer in Athenian democracy, um, perhaps not even in, in sort of in, in free speech. He, he I, I think, um, was was more sort of along the lines that it should be uh, an elite that that wielded uh, that wielded power. So in that sense, he could be seen as someone who was advocating sort of seditious uh, ideas. Also, he had some heterodox religious views, and and the Athenian democracy was not a secular state in the way that we. We see it. So, so it, it, it might have been a case of, uh, of, of, of the Athenians uh, saying, well, um, not only did, did this person have close contacts with the people who overthrew our democracy and, and, and led to, to bloody revolutions and purges of, of, of Athenian citizens, uh, he, uh, he also angered the gods, uh, that might have been responsible for all kinds of, 
uh, of of ill fortunes, uh, and 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 so that might have been the reason why he was uh, he, he was tried and, and executed. Now he could have escaped um, execution. It, it, it's a fact that the that the jury court a higher higher number of of uh, jurors voted for his execution than for his guilt, and that's because he didn't exactly endear himself to to the to the jury in his, in his defense. Um, uh, but but he, pro- he probably could have escaped, sort of with, with banishment or, or or something like like that. Um, so, but but in, but but sort of to cut a sh- long story short, I think it's important to sort of say that that Socrates is in many ways the exception to the rule. Uh, so it was not customary that people would be treated uh, in, in 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 that in that manner. We, we're not exactly certain how many people had been sort of subjected to. To trial for speech, but there was no inquisition. There was no sort of censorship board or or, or the like um, that we would see later on in, uh, in in European history. Well, we see that that's a recurring theme, of course, in your book that speech as a threat to power, uh, and that seems to be part of the Socrates story. And people who believe in free speech up until it might threaten their power uh, is a consistent recurring theme of kind of. I mean, I've always known that, but reading your book, I'm like, this is a stunningly common thing to happen. Yeah, it's it's it really is, and it's probably has to do with our psychological makeup as a species, <laughs> uh, and and the way that we sort of react to threats, real and perceived. Um, that you know, it's much easier to laud uh, the, the, uh, a principle of toleration and free speech when you're. When you're in power or when you don't feel threatened, but when you suddenly feel you're living in uncertain times and you, you believe that people uh, who, who have extreme ideas that are, that run counter to, 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 to your most cherished ideals uh, are in ascendancy, um, you become much more inclined to say that they should be censored or, or restricted or punished or banned. Um, and, and so unfortunately, I think that's, uh, Sort of hardwired into to, to to the human brain, and and we see it again and again, as you mentioned. Even you know some of the the great uh, founders and framers of uh, in, in American history had their limits uh, on, on on free speech. Uh, so 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 this is probably something that one of the reasons why the history of free speech tends to sort of seesaw a lot, um, and and both because we're good, very good at convincing ourselves. You know, even people who believe in free speech, that on this particular area where we feel very strongly uh, about something, uh, free speech should uh, have an asterisk, which says not for this uh, particular type of speech. And but that is completely different from all the other attempts at limiting free speech, which are authoritarian. Are you able to identify someone who maybe gives a earliest? principled defense of freedom of speech? I mean, I guess that could be different. There's obviously different arguments for free speech. Some of them are just, you know, the limits of state power. Some of them are the need to work out the marketplace of ideas and, you know, work out these things. Is there someone who early on kind of articulates this as a, as a principle, as a, even as opposed to something that's like efficacious, as opposed to someone saying, I want to speak, therefore free speech, but saying it is important to have free speech as a principle? I think uh, we can point to someone uh, called Dirk Kornhild. Uh, he was a Dutch sort of heterodox theologian um, uh, who who who, um, who wrote at the time when when the Dutch Republic um, was was founded, uh, and he was a he 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 wrote this um, symposium on, on on freedom of conscience. So it's it's this these fictional. Uh, dialogues between great theologians uh, and and philosophers, and so uh, he has an an alter ego there that argues with sort of that that, that is really him, himself sort of his a ventriloquist for himself uh, that argues that you know um, not only should heresy be killed with uh, not not with the sword but but with with, with words. Uh, uh, but also that, you know, it, he says something along the lines that it has always, uh, you know, been against uh, an attempt to, to destroy liberty by, by um, forbidding good books to squelch the truth. So that's a very early uh, 
defense of, of press freedom much earlier than John Milton's era Pagitica, which in any event was not a very principled defense. Um, then you have, um, in the 1640s, you have um, the levelers in England um, who, who I think uh, have a very, very radical defense of free speech that chimes with their belief in, in, in sort of universal freedom of conscience and universal male suffrage at a very, very early time. Unfortunately, they, they are sort of quickly snuffed out by the forces of Cromwell um, and uh, and almost forgotten but you can sort of you can sort of see an, an echo of their thoughts in the ideas of Madison uh, later on even though I don't think the the founders and framers specifically acknowledge the uh, the, the levelers but but some of the ideas are, are strikingly similar uh, about the value of, uh, of, of of free speech and, uh, and, and freedom of conscience. It's a pretty big, big gap with, between, say, Athenian democracy and 1500, 1600. It's a pretty big gap of, and one reason that we might think that gap exists is because the church had a fair amount of significant power over what you could say and do. And it wasn't even so much political as it was religious, although those were intertwined to, to challenge heresy. And, and that's one question you kind of defend the quote unquote dark ages which is which is i think correct but in a religious context if if it is believed that the absolute truth is held and that heresy is very dangerous squelching down on speech kind of makes sense which is of course why the church did it yeah uh, uh, absolutely you know i think it's very difficult for the modern mind the 21st century mind to understand how um, how important religion was to people um, at, at that time. So in many ways, you know, I, I think, you know, maybe this is being too provocative, but even people who are religious today are, are probably religious in a very different way than, than people were at the time, where they absolutely believe that that God could interfere and, and, and was likely to interfere and punish uh, humans, um, for instance, if they if they allowed heretics to pollute the community of of, of believers, uh, which would not only sort of was one thing to to sort of um, to allow your own soul and eternal life to to forego that, but if you polluted society as such, you risked the eternal life uh, and 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 the salvation of of souls of of everyone else, and ultimately divine. Uh, intervention through the wrath of God, who might punish uh, Christendom with all kinds of of, uh, of disasters, and seen in that light, if you have, if you tr- if you believe that you have the truth, capital T truth, um, then you know, trying to root out uh, heresy and and uh, and establish uh, and entrench orthodoxy, it, you you might see yourself as as a, as a force for good. Combating the evils of, uh, of of her of heretics who try to to throw in into danger the 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 eternal life and, and souls of, of innocent uh, Christians. So so what you're doing is 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 is, is something good and, and benign, and that is why someone as as powerful and intellectual as as Thomas Aquinas, for instance, defends the death penalty for obstinate heretics and and also. For, for blasphemy, and he comes up with these really elaborate um, philosophical, theological um, defenses of why it is just to to uh, execute obstinate heretics uh, who persist with, uh, with with heretical beliefs even after having been been warned and and, uh, and and initially punished. So, do we see any heroes in that era? I mean, Aquinas is a hero. Who, who, who is a yeah? Who is a liberal? Uh, I, the, the chapter on on the medieval period uh, is called the not so dark ages. So we have sort of um, we we have if for instance if we move to the Abbasid Caliphate um, uh, in in the Islamic world and and sort of the adjacent territories, uh, it becomes a very fertile ground for 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 philosophy and. Science, medicine, Islam. You have some incredible uh, polymaths who are who, who, who's, whose um, scientific and philosophical outputs are absolutely mind-boggling. And you also have sort of in the eighth to the tenth century, uh, 
the most radical free thinkers um, of the medieval period, far more, I think, radical than than anyone contemporary in in the in the Christian West. So someone like Al Rawandi, who comes across almost like uh, you know as an agnostic or or atheist, uh, even you know, I think it's it's difficult to to label him. Uh, and unfortunately, we only have sort of his his ideas from his ideological enemies. But the, it's, it seems quite clear that he's he's very very um, you know um, heterodox and then sort of rejects prophecy, rejects uh, holy books as as constituting truth. And and you know uh, even today in in some uh, Muslim majority countries that could land you in, in very hot 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 trouble. Um, and you have someone like Al Razi who also sort of points to reason as being the ultimate guide um, rather than, than than sort of orthodox religious uh, beliefs so and and you had caliphs who were certainly not committed to to free speech or or tolerance in the way that we understand those concepts today but who nonetheless sponsored the um, the translation of almost all secular greek um, ancient uh, works on, on, on philosophy and, and science and medicine and astronomy and so on. And, and so, and that, that creates, um, that helps inspire a number of, of, of great philosophers, as I mentioned, and polymaths whose ideas inspire people in the West, including Aquinas, uh, and, and contribute to, 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 um, to the to the spreading um, of um, of Aristotelian philosophy and, and pagan text in in the in, in the West, and that um, Aristotelian philosophy in the context of emerging universities becomes a real game changer because you have these who are perfectly pious Christian uh, scholars and academics, but who have an insatiable thirst and appetite for for pagan uh, texts and, and and want to expand the the permissible limits of of, uh, of reason and, and the use of, of Aristotelian uh, philosophy. And initially you have these speech codes by the University of Paris and others, but then suddenly sort of academic freedom and, and inquiry becomes a, a, a competitive advantage as, as other universities say, well, you know, if you want to study a bit of Aristotle, you know, you can, you know, come over to, to our university because we don't ban that. And so, so uh, and that in, in, in turn creates a pressure for, for the church and 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 universities to to sort of gradually allow more and more um, 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 pagan uh, philosophy uh, until until Aristotelianism becomes all a part of orthodoxy uh, it, it, itself later on. Um, Thanks to so, Aquinas. So think, yeah. yeah, So 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 that that um, I think is is a hugely important part of the uh, of the story, even if there's no concept of. Of free speech as such, even though the permissible in- inquiry uh, limits of, of inquiry and, and academic freedom would not involve, would not extend to sort of rejecting uh, uh, Christianity or engaging in, uh, in, in atheism or or, or, or sort of um, uh, or, or the like that would be pushing it too far. Um, but but I think it has an influence on on, on later developments, and, and in that sense, I think it's fair to say that the, the medieval period um, it, it has some, some 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 really important uh, elements for for the wider history of free speech. But I think another reason why it would take such a long time for principal free speech um, to to develop in in the sort of the early modern period is the fact that uh, Roman republicanism. Um, the, the concept of free speech there um, was more influential than Athenian sort of egalitarian free speech. So in the in the history of free speech, you see a recurrent pattern between a, a competition, if you like, between an egalitarian conception of free speech with its roots in in the Athenian democracy, where everyone, you know, no matter how poor or uneducated, has a voice, uh, at least theoretically, in in public affairs and versus the more egalitarian top-down approach of the Roman Republic, where it's principally an educated, wealthy elite, sort of the senatorial types like Cato and Cicero, who uh, who 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 exercise uh, free speech, and where where ordinary citizens, the plebs uh, and the like, don't have, for instance, a, a right to speak in assemblies, unlike uh, in Athens, and and where you know the Romans have the distinguished between. 
uh, liberty and licentiousness, and whereas they they look upon the Greeks as as tolerating licentiousness, and 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 the, and the Romans, uh, someone like Cicero, you know, who lauds free speech as a, as a great ideal, but but he sees sort of the one of the reasons why 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 Greeks the Greek uh, sort of what, the Greek civilization is no longer uh, the front runner was because they allowed the unwashed mob uh, to hold political power and the these unlearned uh, people so so the romans had a much more top down elitist conception of free speech which um in early modern times and, and also in the enlightenment uh, held more sway uh, among many early defenders uh, of free speech who did not necessarily see free speech as extending to everyone so someone like voltaire is a good example he believed in free speech but he also believed in sort of enlightened absolutism so he would see sort of you'd have these absolutist rulers and they should allow free speech for a small learned uh, elite and that would then lead society into a better place but that did not extend to uh, to the unwashed mob who should be treated like monkeys how much does the printing press matter in this story oh i think it matters uh, immensely um uh, of course the printing press does not lead to the principle of uh, of free speech, um, but it leads to a, the practice of free speech for a while, at least. Uh, and of course, um, you know, in, initially the printing press is is really greeted as a divine instrument by the Catholic Church, for instance, because it allows the church to spread its message much much for, faster, much more widely. It, it allows you know orthodoxy to be um, uh, you know, kept in order uh, and 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 defined much more clearly and, and and uniformly. But then, an ornery, constipated German monk comes along uh, by the name of of Martin Luther, and uh, and he has other ideas, and and he really sort of invents the art of religious populism. You know, if if Martin Luther had been on Twitter today, he would. Have had uh, a lot of a lot of followers uh, and uh, and many hot takes and been extremely popular because sort of instead of engaging in sort of dry theological Latin uh, treatises, he starts writing in the vernacular German and writes short, punchy um, uh, prose uh, garnished with cartoons and memes uh, that that uh, that appeal to the ordinary persons, to emotions and 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 and. Uh, the imagination of, uh, of 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 ordinary people, and uh, and of course Martin Luther comes to the conclusion that the Catholic Church is basically engaged in a huge scam, and that uh, he has understood the truth of the Bible, whereas the Catholic Church ha- has corrupted it. Um, and um, of course, the Catholic Church is is not too pleased. And Martin Luther is, is given the chance to uh, to recant, and and he refuses. Um, and then he sort of churns out uh, these pamphlets. He he translates the New Testament into German. He encourages um, ordinary people to be taught how to read and write, um, in order for for people to be as uh, children and so on to be instructed in 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 the Bible. Um, uh, but the you know. What I think is important to stress is that Martin Luther did not believe in universal freedom of conscience. It's not that he said, well, everyone should have the right to read the Bible. And, you know, if they find um, whatever they find in there to be the truth, uh, that's that, that that's fine. He believed that he had the truth. And so he wanted everyone else to see the same truth as his. But then what happens is when you allow everyone, when you democratize access to the Bible, um, people don't have the same interpretation. People get all kinds of crazy ideas from sort of Anabaptists uh, with sort of proto-communist ideas uh, to, to 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 an alphabet soup of of, of various Protestant uh, sects, and that horrifies Luther because that he sees the disruption, um, uh, and and um, and then he 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 turns into someone who advocates the death penalty for blasphemy uh, and. And, and, and so on. And so in many ways, the early Protestant reformers were as, as committed to intolerance and censorship as, as the Catholic Church. It, it was not like they were these at the vanguard of, um, of, of, of toleration and, and free speech, even though um, some Protestant hi- historians uh, have, have tried to sort of paint a, a, a straight uh, 
uh, line from from the Reformation to 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 freedom of conscience. Now, now these these developments are certainly related and 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 very important for later developments, but. But um, but it would not. Martin Luther was certainly not a, a sort of free speech absolutist in, in in any sense. But you know the genie was out of the bottle, and uh, and 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 it led, of course, gradually through religious wars and persecution and so on to to various conceptions of tolerance, sort of from the grudgingly accepting that you know if you lived in in a country with a Catholic uh, king or prince, then the population had to be. Catholic and and vice versa with Protestants to um, an ex- so expanding conceptions of of religious uh, tolerance and also just the fact that that the printing press made it more difficult to censor all speech even though um, centralized attempts to to censor speech were, were were certainly put in place especially with the Counter Reformation um, and it, I think it just gradually over time accustomed Europeans to be confronted with ideas that uh, they were not used to that were previously thought dangerous and then over time that you know they saw that being confronted with different religious ideas those that differed from yours was not necessarily a threat to national security or or your salvation and and that sowed the seeds for 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 later developments pointing towards also sort of secular free speech yeah that seems like the post-Westphalian compromise seems like an important point, even though, as you pointed out, part of that compromise was that the ruler got to dictate within his ruled area what they had to believe. But there, you start to see the seeds of this mutual disarmament, I think, that is part of liberalism in the, in the small L sense, that basically, uh, today you, tomorrow me. Like, I'm not going to do this to you, so you can't do it to me. And I think you see that in the middle of the 17th century, kind of for the first time. Sure, and but and and, and, and interestingly, um, the first places we see um, religious toleration, sort of almost in a in a sort of a proto constitutional manner, is um, for instance the, in 1568 the Edict of of of, uh, of Torda, which is sort of one of the first edicts of, of religious freedom in, in European history in, in in Transylvania, and and. And that sort of essentially provides uh, an individual right uh, for for people to follow their conscience in in, uh, in 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 religion. So that's not in the West. That's actually in 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 Eastern Central uh, Central Europe. You have some of the same things in in the Polish Lithuanian um, uh, Commonwealth. Um, but then, of course, uh, when we move west, the the Dutch Republic. Um, become sort of the epicenter of religious tolerance and and sort of the first printing house of of Europe. But it's imp- it, it, it's it's important to note that you know I, I mentioned Dirk Kornhert as as an early proponent of free speech and, and religious toleration, but he was also someone who was who was censored uh, in the Dutch Republic. So the I you know Dutch tolerance was not universal and it was not principled. In, in fact, it wasn't even codified. It was not you know apart from 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 a commitment to religious uh, tolerance in in, uh, in in sort of the founding document of, of of the of the Dutch Republic, there was no law or constitution that protected free speech. But there was something again, which I think is uh, is is sort of a um, a general tendency. There was a very decentralized control over information an opinion because that you had a very weak political center in the Dutch Republic. So you had these quite autonomous provinces and they guarded their political autonomy quite jealously because they had been the subject of, of, of the Spanish Habsburgs um, that had sort of subjected them to inquisition and, and, and all these things. So if, if one province didn't like uh, one printer, he could skip to another province that might uh, tolerate him and 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 one of the reasons might very well be commercial. You know, the the, the Dutch were, were were very commercially minded, and so they could make a lot of money by printing stuff that could then be smuggled across borders to to European countries that had much more rigorous uh, rigorous uh, censorship. So, but there was also a more cosmopolitan atmosphere, I think. In for instance, in in Amsterdam, so you have ultimately, you know, you have. 
uh, Descartes, uh, René Descartes, uh, flees to the Dutch uh, Republic. Um, um, uh, you have um, you have Spinoza, uh, of course, who um, who, who writes uh, his his great treatise, which has a chapter on on free speech and and the freedom to to philosophize, which he sees as the precondition for social peace in a, in in, in a uh, diverse state, which is completely uh, turns things on on their head in in, in the ways that the people are, are thought thought about these things where sort of religious uniformity was seen as, as the precondition for for social peace. And even John Locke, uh, you know, uh, spends time in, in the Dutch uh, Republic. So it is com- comparatively very open-minded and tolerant. Um, and Pierre Bale, uh, an, another great sort of proto-liberal. Uh, so, so, so the Dutch Republic attracts these uh, free thinkers who who contribute mightily to uh, to to early liberal uh, ideas. One person I, I want you to ask you about because I had not really heard the story about Johann Friedrich Strunze uh, and his <laughs> maybe two months of liberal rule uh, in in Sweden or Norway. Was it Norway? Uh, in in- uh, D- uh, Denmark, Norway. Yeah. So so yeah. The interesting thing is you know so so. We, we talked a bit about, you know, the Dutch Republic in, in its heydays in the 17th century, but the 18th century is sort of the breakthrough of free speech in, in Europe. So by that time, even sort of absolutist rulers like uh, Frederick the Great of Prussia, Catherine the Great um, of, of Russia, Joseph uh, II, I think, in, in, in Austria, uh, uh, sort of come around to the idea that it's important with some degree of, of free speech, sort of a very elitist model of free speech, but for an enlightened state, it was necessary for progress uh, and so on. And of course, you had, um, in, in, in Britain, you had um, radical Whigs, like the, the authors of, of Cato's letters and others that, that really spread the idea uh, um, of, of, of uh, free speech. But the first legal uh, protection of free speech came in Sweden in 1766. And the first country to abolish, formally abolish any and all c- types of censorship was was Denmark, the kingdom of, of, of Denmark, Norway. Now that owed a lot to Stronze, who you mentioned, who was actually a German physician, became the, the physician of our batshit crazy King <laughs> Christian VII. Um, um, I, I, I don't know if he was bipolar or schizophrenic, but he, he, he was, he was essentially mentally ill. And Swanson not only moved into the, to the bedroom with, with the queen, he also took over the throne. And he was sort of a, a radical enlightenment proponent, um, into Spino, uh, Spinoza's ideas and, and the like. And so he just sort of started signing all these edicts, sort of an amazing amount of edicts, sort of abolish torture, free political prisoners. Uh, and uh, and one of the first moves was simply just to say, the whole idea of pre-publication censorship is just now gone. So overnight, Denmark, which had been this very sort of centralized, strictly Lutheran absolutist state, um, uh, engage in an experiment of egalitarian free speech where everyone could uh, could could uh, could write whatever they wanted but and even Strun said it only had a c- certain tolerance yeah, for that then w- w- Strunz probably expected that that uh, Danes would uh, be grateful and and thank him and lots of Danes you know uh, all the documents from that area and pamphlets are still uh, saved and and there'll soon be an, an English translation uh, uh, of them of, of that era that I by Frederick Janfeld and and Ulrich Langen, two great scholars. I so if you're interested in that, you can you, you can look that up. But um, but but lots of Danes were very critical of Sturms, so they you know they didn't appreciate a German usurper who didn't even speak their language, uh, who bedded the queen, uh, and had these uh, radical ideas. Uh, so they criticized him, and you know much like today's discussion also about social media, you also had all kinds of sort of uh, you know. Um, false rumors and uh, not so nice things being written uh, in in shrill pamphlets uh, where people started sort of attacking each other. And so in 1971, Stones said, "Oh, you know what? Um, it, it 1771. Might have been that I, yeah, 1771. Sorry, mm-hmm. uh, it might I might well have abolished uh, pre-publication censorship, but post-publication restrictions on free speech still apply." 
uh, and uh, but but that couldn't save him, so the damage was done, and, and he had basically undermined his own rule, and and so he was deposed in a palace coup, and he was brutally executed, um, had his was dismembered, and his body parts and head displayed prominently uh, around the country. Um, and so hoist by your own petard, maybe. Yeah, you can watch the film uh, Royal Affair, um, which, which shows the, the whole sordid, sordid, uh, affair. But interestingly, you know, even though censorship came, came creeping back, there was formally pre-publication censorship was never again, um, fully reintroduced in Denmark. So, so, so you could say that in a certain sense, uh, Strunz's radical enlightenment, uh, reforms uh, survived even if, if only limping on. And he didn't. So America <laughs> figures did. pretty prominently in the story of free speech. It's one of the things I do at Cato is is First Amendment stuff and constitutional law. Uh, we have a pretty strong First Amendment here. Um, do you have a theory about why the colonists sort of adhered so strongly to this very strict principle of free speech and then very quickly didn't 10 years after they yeah. passed the Bill of Rights? <laughs> so... Um... I would say, you know, it's, it's interesting to go back to the 17th century, um, and look at the incredibly strict speech codes in, uh, in, in the, in the colonies. Um, and, and even sort of some of the first, uh, newspapers and attempts to at journalism that were very quickly cracked down upon. Um, and so, so for instance, you know, if you go to Pennsylvania, William Penn is this, you know, I guess prisoner of conscience uh, who who's, who's then given uh, a Pennsylvanian set up this experiment with religious toleration, and and that's all great, but at, you know I think it's in 1683 William Penn presides over a sort of a government council that convicts someone to be whipped in in the marketplace of Philadelphia for sedition uh, because you are not allowed to criticize the government under 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 both under sort of the British common law of sedition, but also under these colonial laws against sedition that were often strictly uh, enforced. Rhode Island, the same. Rhode Island, which was sort of called Rogue Island because of its commitment to religious tolerance, uh, you could be heavily, severely punished for 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 criticizing the government uh, government there. But I think um, one of the game changers <clears throat> is probably Cato's letters that I mentioned. Um, which sort of go viral in, in the colonies. Um, which is what the Cato Institute is named after too. Exactly. Um, um, and, 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 uh, in Cato's letter number 15, um, comes up with this great enlightenment meme that goes viral all over Europe, uh, even, even reaches radicals in Russia, that free speech is the bulwark of liberty and, and, and the dread of, of tyrants. And you see that being repeated over and over in pamphlets uh, in the in 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 the colonies, and then um, you have in 1735, I think, the Sanger case, uh, where the, the the governor, I think, of, of New York, has set up sort of a a newspaper to praise himself, and then his political rivals set up uh, an, another newspaper to to ridicule him and criticize him, and he's desperate to sort of he tries all kinds of things, you know, he uh, to he tries to have a a, a, a grand jury indictment that that fails, so you can, he, he can't convince New Yorkers to to convict people for engaging in uh, in, in seditious uh, libel. So ultimately, he he goes after the publisher uh, and, um, uh, and 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 sort of in, uses this very sort of draconian measure where he he's basically uh, brings the case himself, sort of circum circumvents. Uh, the, the the grand jury uh, system, uh, he and and sort of uh, ensures that he has a friendly jury and uh, and, and, uh, and 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 a judge, but then um, uh, he still loses the case, you know. So a, a great uh, lawyer, Alexander Hamilton, he's called not that not that Alexander Hamilton, another one, the greatest trial lawyer of his generation, comes in and he, you know, basically. Uh, bases his uh, argument on Cato's letters and the great bulwark of, of, of liberty theory, which the New Yorkers, uh, have, had, had read in this opposition newspapers where, where reprints of, of Cato's letters had, had been frequent. And so the, the, this poor hapless Dutch printer, uh, singer is, um, uh, 
uh, is acquitted. And that is sort of more or less the end of uh, the attempts to uh, to have people convicted for seditious libel in, in jury trials. And I think that then opens up uh, that that already I think points to a culture of free speech in in America, um, where you also had sort of people in taverns and, uh, and 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 in pamphlets discussing all kinds of things. And then again, I think you have weak central authority. So uh, you know, uh, um, in in one colony, it might might differ uh, uh, from the other, and the ability of the British to really impose seditious libel laws the way that they could back home in Britain was not the same because the colonists had other ideas and and were were adamant that they got to they got to discuss and and, and criticize their, their their rulers. So in that sense, I think the 18th century breeds a much more robust culture of free speech. In the American colonies, which paves the way towards when when things go go south from a British point of view in 1765, um, and then also I think free speech really becomes unifying. You sort of it becomes one of the principles that you can point to as specifically American and one that the British are trying to snuff out, and that shows just how despotic the British are. You know, it's a bit rich by. By some of these slaveholding American revolutionaries that talk about British slavery, but that's sort of the the, the wording that they use. So it becomes a unifying uh, principle which sets them apart from 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 the old British way of 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 of, of doing things. And at the same time, they the, the the culture of free speech has made it impossible for the British to sort of impose centralized command and control. Uh, and I think that. Is 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 a big difference to what goes on, for instance, with the, with the French Revolution, where things go out of hand. There's no comparative culture of free speech uh, in France. You know, you've had this very elaborate pre-publication and post-publication censorship. So you had a small elite of Enlightenment figures who could write things for for the elite, but you didn't have the same uh, culture of free speech extending to ordinary people, and so there was no real um, you weren't accustomed to to, to discussing uh, ideas, and the, so so the principle of free speech and debates over free speech in France quickly turned deadly, and and sort of political heresy became a, a death sentence. We will, we you know the once the, the the First Amendment, of course, had been had been adopted, ratified in 1791. It wouldn't take long for Americans to compromise. The First Amendment with the with the Sedition Act, but you know when you look at at the fallout from there and compare it to what happened in France or or Britain at the same time, this universal crackdown uh, after the French Revolution, then it's pre- pretty mild stuff in the US, in, in, in America compared to that. So, so that's a very long way of saying that I think a culture, a comparatively strong culture of free speech in America meant that this principle um, was given a much stronger legal protection, at least on paper. Um, but, and, but also meant that, you know, the first attempt, the Sedition Act backfired spectacularly. So, you know, Republican newspapers mushroomed, uh, and the Federalists were trounced, uh, and never to be seen again. Now, hopefully we'd hope that this development of believing in free speech in Western democracies is established, that we've got to this point when we, we can read this history, uh, your excellent book and say, you know, this was a long struggle to get to a point that we should accept as liberals that freedom of speech is sacrosanct and a part of any free society. But it's not always the case that everything goes up and up and up and and things could be going the other <laughs> way now. Yeah, no, uh, I think, you know, um, I think in a certain way, certain sense, we live in a golden age of free speech. Uh, so certainly... Many, uh, you know, if if Spinoza was, you know, if 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 he could see what could be said and shared uh, in real time across the globe, uh, without censorship, he would be amazed. Maybe he would actually think that things have had gotten too far. Um, um, but but so so in that sense, there's no doubt that we enjoy free speech on a whole different level. You know, it's a constitutionally protected right. It's a it's a it's, it's at least. In some countries also, it's been elevated to a norm of international human rights law, even if it's not respected as such uh, everywhere. 
And even, you know, even in, in many illiberal authoritarian states, you have to pay lip service to the idea of, of, of free speech. Um, so, and so, so, and, and just the technology that you and I are using right now is, of course, uh, incredibly potent in furthering the practical exercise of free speech. No one is, is listening in, I hope, on this con- conversation or, 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 you know, censoring it. And, you know, you can, you can upload it and, and, uh, I'd be very surprised if, uh, if, if you were to suffer any legal consequences for it. Um, uh, so, so, but on the other hand, I think that we're, the, the, this golden age is in retreat. So we're living through a free speech recession, which is, I think, started more than a decade ago, where we see sort of, you have all kinds of institutions that try to measure free speech and democracy, freedom house, you know, varieties of democracy. Um, and so on. I think pretty uniformly, all of them, all, all of the data points to free speech being in global decline for more than a, for more than a decade. You also see it with, you know, number of jailed, uh, and killed journalists, uh, and so on. Now, this is not surprising in authoritarian states, of course, because since the overthrow of the Athenian democracy, the page one of the authoritarian's playbook is, uh, that to crack down on free speech and ensure control over information and, and opinion. But I, what I think is very worrying is that we see liberal democracies, particularly in Europe, also following this trend of restricting free speech, and especially due to what I call elite panic about uh, in the digital age, sort of, um, sort of a re- recurring um, or reenactment of, of the conflict between egalitarian and elitist free speech that elites now uh, are, are worried about that social media and the internet allows uh, the unwashed mob uh, access to unfiltered information and the institutional gatekeepers resent them not being able to filter uh, that uh, information in a responsible uh, manner. Um, uh, and, and of course, it is true that free speech comes with harms and costs, and, and some of those harms and costs might be amplified by, by social media, even though I think we tend to ignore the, the, all the, the benefits and take them for granted because we've been spoiled with free speech for, for a long time. Should we be concerned about the size of things like Twitter and Facebook? Then? Yeah, I, I, th- I think so. You know, I think I, I would, you know, if you ask me sort of, um, seven, eight years ago, I, I think I would have probably given sort of a very orthodox libertarian, uh, answer that, you know, this is private property and, uh, these platforms can do whatever the hell they want. You know, no one uh, has the right to, uh, to interfere. And, you know, I still don't think I'm not on board with Republicans who want sort of to the government to, to, to legislate and say that they have to uphold viewpoint and uh, neutrality or, uh, First Amendment like uh, standards. I, I think that will lead to, to worse places than we are now. But I still think at the same time that sort of libertarian orthodoxy cannot, um, you know, does, ignores, uh, the fact that the practical exercise of free speech today is, uh, exercised on, on these platforms. And so if you're, you know, if you were a politician or a prominent media, as someone in, in, in the media, um, and you were thrown off, you were deplatformed, then, you know, it'd be very difficult to have a voice <laughs> and reach people. And, and so, and so it does impact uh, free speech. And that again has to do with the idea of the culture of free speech. And I think there are very strong cases to argue that free speech is not only, uh, about the relationship between state and individual, but, but about a, a larger commitment to tolerance and social dissent. And that goes all the way back to the Athenian democracy and the idea of parousia. You see it also in John Stuart Mill. You see it in Tocqueville's um, um, famous treatise on, on democracy in America, where he says, you know, the American commitment to free speech uh, for, it creates a formidable barrier around uh, liberty of opinion. But woe to the person who goes outside majority opinion. That person will be subjected to to persecution, uh, and 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 it can be worse than an outer de fe that you could face in in in, in Europe. Uh, George Orwell says some of the same things. Frederick Douglass uh, on on slavery, who's someone who's being heckled. Uh, by, 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 by mobs and not by the government. So, so I think, and, and I think that, so there's an analogy there to, to these private platforms. What is the answer then? I think that's, uh, 
That's difficult, but, but I would say, you know, given how decentralized authority has been key in furthering free speech, I think a technological development where we have a more decentralized ecosystem on online ecosystem um, would would help sort of back to the original um, ideals of the Internet, if, if that is possible and feasible. Um, and also providing users more control over content, I think, uh, is, is another. So, so, you know, if, 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 if the mega platforms did less content moderation, sort of, um, scale down a bit on that, but then allowed users and maybe third parties to come in and offer solutions that you could flick on and off. So if you're worried about anti-Semitism, some, you know, the ADL could create a filter with a very, broad definition of anti-Semitism and you could be spared that kind of thing, but it wouldn't have sort of the the huge uh, centralizing effects as if Facebook adopted that definition of anti-Semitism for 3.3 billion people. Um, so th those are the, some of the, the solutions that I um, am hoping to, to see, but, but I, you know, I get this, these are early days, you know, uh, if you looked at journalism 200 years ago and you look at journalism today, a lot, a lot has changed. And uh, interestingly, you know, people were also extremely worried about newspapers uh, back then and, and saw that as a recipe for disaster. And, and, and today it's, it's sort of the traditional media and newspapers who were once seen as the radical uh, corrosive forces to institutionalize society who are, uh, who, who are at the forefront of demanding more regulation of, of social media. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, make sure to rate and review us in Apple Podcasts or in your favorite podcast app. Free Thoughts is produced by Landry Ayers. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at libertarianism.org.